If you walk into a school today and you go over to any student and you say, is the work that you're doing real or fake? They can give you an answer like that. You know Community Planet, right? You know yeah. about it, right? Since Community Planet, I've learned to be more of a leader. Oh, are you still making excuses over there? Well, I got something for you, a challenge. Why don't you go 24 hours, no excuses? We probably in schools too often hold off on making connections to the real world and view school as preparation for life and not a part of life. As a Harry Potter fan, I don't want Harry's name used on products that are associated with this injustice. Harry, Ron, and Hermione wouldn't stand for it, and neither do I. Every time a school says to a kid that what you value outside of school doesn't belong in the classroom, they also deliver the opposite message, that what we do in this classroom has no value outside of the school. I'm at school and you know I just have to sit quietly and pay attention. Whereas I feel like more comfortable here because you know I have film and music at my hands. What can be better than that? I think the more you can make learning relevant to the way kids are living, the problems they feel in their lives, to the communities they live in, the more it validates learning as key to their citizenship in the world and their participation in the world. Being active and moving around to different places is a big part of what I do because I see it as just a big network. All the knowledge isn't going to be found in one place. I mean, I think one of the real challenges we have is that it's not enough, I think, to go through school and just say, know something, but it's important that you actually have an interest and a passion for doing something and you feel inspired. All right, who's got a camera? Yeah, let's get on this side. Instead of being trapped in the classroom and just reading out of textbooks, we get to actually get out there and experience what they're doing. I think the best case scenario is when you inspire a vision of the world in which the whole world becomes like a museum, like the whole world is now open to curiosity and wonder. It's everywhere all around you, there's something to be learned. In the vital task of educating our children, experts, teachers, and parents are all recognizing how crucial it is to enable and encourage young people to pursue their interests beyond the classroom. And thanks to today's digital tools, young people are able to interact with their world as never before. It's a whole new opportunity to stimulate learning and to enrich their lives. Is school enough for 21st century kids? Join us to see how young people themselves are helping us answer this question. I really think that to get kids really engaged in a project, you need to find that thing within the context of the subject matter, within the context of the actual activity that, you know, really connects them to the final outcome. Do you have any idea of when Rosie's coming? Could be very soon. That's certainly what we're hoping. Right now, it's been colder in Oklahoma than it has been in Maine. That idea that what you're doing is contributing to something bigger than yourself and that in the end you're going to do something meaningful, something that is tangible and is going to make a difference in some way. That's the point where they really get engaged and start to care. I think I told you guys before the floor is going to be heated so it's going to be a radiant floor heat which is going to be a lot easier on Rosie's hip and uh, when she stands around on it all day it'll be a lot less impact and they're actually going to put that layer of sand over the top of this once it's all poured and cured and the barn's up. And so she'll be standing in the softer sand, it'll all be warm, and it'll be like standing on the beach in Tahiti or something for Rosie, so she'll be pretty happy. When we come next week, it'll start looking like a regular barn. Pretty exciting, it won't be long. Yeah. I was really excited. Elephants are one of my favorite animals, and it's kind of cool for me that I can actually take part, and I never knew I'd be able to do that, so. I first met Rosie in uh, 1978, when my brother and I were working on the Carson Barn Circus. Um, I signed on. We had a little juggling act when we were kids. My second job was working with the 26 elephants we had in the road that year. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Children of all ages, welcome 
to Carson and Barnes, the world's only five ring circus. Hit it, Perry. Here's me with Rosie, probably uh, 30-something years ago. I was uh, 19 this year when we were doing that. She was orphaned and bottle raised, and so she has a real affection for people. And even back then, um, she was renowned in the show for being the sweetest elephant. She sustained some injuries to her shoulder. She's had a long career in the circus. And right now, uh, she is living at the Endangered Ark Foundation in Hugo, Oklahoma. And so my brother Tom and I came up with a plan in conjunction with the Endangered Ark here. There are some elephants down here who could really benefit from advanced physical therapy. So we designed a facility where we can really take care of them like you would an expensive racehorse. And she'll be coming along with Opal, another elephant from the herd. We started construction on the barn uh, last year, and it went really quickly. We've got a beautiful uh, acre of land with seven apple trees, a couple of big pine trees, um, a wallow for them, high sandy places, all kinds of features for them to really become interested in. This entire area is going to be free roaming space for Rosie the elephant. So we want to make sure that we document as many of the plants as we possibly can that are within probably 10 feet of this uh, big loop that they've cleared out. Once we have that, we can give that report to the people at Hope Elephants and they're going to be able to use it to assess what they need to do with this back piece of property. Project NOAA is a social media tool and a research tool combined. And you can go out with your mobile phone and take an image and record that experience with wildlife, whether it's a plant or an animal, whatever you might see. And you put it into the app on your mobile phone. You put in any kind of data about that particular experience. So you put down some descriptive things. You put down some habitat information. You uplink to uh, the satellite and get the geographic data so you know the exact latitude and longitude uh, where that experience happened. And then you contribute it to the pool, essentially. So it goes out there with hundreds and thousands of other interactions that people have had with wildlife all around the world. And in the same way that you would kind of update your Facebook status, this kind of updates on that central page of Project NOAA. Using mobile phones and our iPod touches, I think it helps us concentrate a lot more instead of having to sit at a desk and just read out of books. It's kind of more exciting and more interesting. Look right here, guys. Yeah. See how white, it has um, a stem. Yeah, and see how it's like it's orange fine. fuzzies? Yeah. That orange fuzzy part is the part that is the real identifying feature for this tree. The Hope Elephant mission has been set up so that the students involved can capture these images of the plants that are in the enclosure where the elephant is going to be, post them onto Project NOAA, get feedback from our other users who have experience with plants and things, uh, oftentimes get help in identifying those organisms. And it's a way for them to assess whether or not there's toxic plants there that could be a danger to the elephant once she arrives. So that's the road where we were, and that's the pinpoint, so you can go ahead and hit my location. It makes me feel really good to be part of it. I think it's really important for it to be a safe place for her to go, and it's important to me, too, to know that um, I'm helping out. Hello. Hello. Hi. Hi. Hi, uh, this is Dan Brown at Cornell University. What can I help you with? And then as far as applying it to some of the middle school curriculum, you know, we're taking the plants that we took from Rosie's, Rosie's paddock, studied here in the classroom, uh, and then reaching out to a professional in the field, Dr. Brown from Cornell, to gain even more information about some of the learning that we're doing. What is the best way to get rid of toxic plants? It depends on the plant. A toxic plant out west, the yellow star thistle that Having communication between novices, if you will, and experts is extremely valuable. It's probably going to be around four, it's seven days, that's 700 pounds of hay a week. And that's, like, that's a lot of hay. That's, and that's a lot of money. That is one of our big expenses, right? They suddenly become real people. And that idea that these are real people just like me is probably the number one thing that says, hey, I could do this. Does everybody remember what zoonotic diseases are? Yes. 
Diseases that are passed from people to animals or from animals to people. Wow, they were actually listening. What the heck? Kids never listen. And kids who might, you know, say, oh, well, I, you know, what's a scientist? All of a sudden start to consider what careers they might want to pursue, and it kind of opens whole new doors. Nice. Some serious ones. I think that if we limit learning to a school environment, we're missing most opportunities. In fact, most uh, environmental scientists and ecologists I know, their passion was not so much from sitting in a classroom setting, but it actually came from being outside and making observations of the natural world because we were just bitten by that bug at some point and wanted to learn more. And for her, you know, she's had a long, you know, life performing and giving. Um, you know, you can imagine the amount of kids who have seen her, who have, you know, been awed by her. And now we're going to try to do everything we can to make sure she is the most doted on elephant in the country. I believe we finally made it. Here they are. And as you see, they look pretty darn happy, don't they? She's really pretty. Isn't she awesome? <laughs> yeah. They've got this nice space here, and the heat comes up from underneath the sand. Mm -hmm. So they lay down the nice warm sand. Put like uh, maybe you know, 20 pellets in each. Pour it? Yeah, okay. or you can try them, whatever you like. We don't want to get them too fat, do we? <laughs> That's good. That's perfect. Come here, Rosie. Come here, move up. out in the morning, then they come in for their morning feed, and then they'll go back out again in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. and, you know, they're really having a great time. Your willingness to take a leadership role in uh, piloting uh, this, I think it has huge implications for the work that we're doing, and so we're going to count on you to be partners with us. Thank you so much for spending time. So often I think rather than measuring the things we most care about, we care about the things that we know how to measure, and, and that can lead to a very narrow focus on some academic skills that while those skills are important, they're not, they're not everything. And, uh, and I think we know, in fact, that what enable people to be productive in the workforce and productive in society entails a range of skills that go far beyond some of those academic priorities or certainly those academic skills. So here you click on a mission and it says, what do you think BPS graduation requirements and learning standards, are they fair? They so this is our way of like showing our opinions and how we feel about it. Yeah, it's like, it's like your voice, basically. Mm. It's like your voice and, everybody, and everybody's going to see it. So like to, this all, the Community Planet is an online social media and game platform that's used to engage communities in planning of one sort or another. So it could be anything from education planning to urban planning to planning for the future of a, of a local community. So in this case, we partnered with the Boston Public Schools to run the game as a way of engaging uh, all stakeholders in the Boston Public Schools in issues of school quality. Welcome again, fellow BI agent. Your mission today, should you choose to accept it, is to investigate and provide valuable input on the following aspects of the BPS School Accountability Framework. Achievement gaps. Achievement gaps. The general concept is that there are a series of missions that are these timed missions, and the players basically answer questions, uh, solve problems for fictional characters, and in each thing they do, they gain points, and then they ultimately earn these tokens. And the idea is that the, these tokens then are spent on um, their values that are their priorities that essentially gets communicated to the district as what they should do moving forward. 
what do you feel that BPS can do to improve like the rate, the proficiency rate for students? I think it would start with uh, the teachers and the parents. I'm always trying to keep an ear to the ground for opportunities to get my kids involved with meaningful projects. I'm being told about this game, this gaming element, and I'm pitching this to the kids. I think this is a good thing. Um, we're getting, you know, policy. We can affect change. And I don't know if the kids truly believed it. Like, yeah, I doubt it. But as they started to play the game and get replies from people, it's sort of something clicked. So sometimes test scores don't have the ability to to show a person's ability. Because how are you going to base someone's education on? Straight test scores. Yeah, I know. That's not that. I think that's not fair. The idea of that's not fair. At first, when he brought the idea to us, I didn't know really what to expect because I'm like, we're teens, and basically what you want us to do is you want us to act like the adults or want to speak up like the adults, and the adults are actually going to ask us for opinions, and that doesn't really happen. But when opportunity arose, I kind of was excited for it because I was a opportunity for me to voice my opinion, be heard, and also represent the school and be heard. For each like comment, you get point. For each like reply, you get point. And here's where you spend them. So if you if you believe that attendance is um, something that you want to push and something that you strongly believe in, then that's where you come and you spend your money on. What did you buy? Oh, what did I buy? I bought. I think I watched the tour on attendance, just because I think. You can't learn if you don't show up. Hello. And the next thing you know, they were really actively going on, and the tokens were starting to rack up. And one of my girls, yeah. Monica, yeah. she started to just pull ahead of everybody else. And it, you know, it sort of became a friendly competition. It was less prodding, less compliance, and more something's happening. This is kind of cool, it's fun. To wow, this is going really well. We're actually getting some stuff done. There's a ton of users on. This is real. On the website, Community Planning, yeah. there was a, a challenge posted saying if you were the headmaster of a turnaround school, what would you do different? I uh, still do the same thing, get kids coming to school. Um, um, we really try to push kids to try to do the best in their learning, keep raising their standards. Keep telling kids the students, when they played this game, they were the ones that were being creative with the media. You know, they were the ones who were um, uploading interesting images and, and you know, using, uh, using YouTube and, and sort of being playful with their responses and, and kind of knowing intuitively um, how to operate in this realm. And they were modeling, you know, and that's what, what was so interesting about this is that this wouldn't have worked unless those students model. Welcome back, BI agent. Your mission this time, should you choose to accept it, is to investigate and provide crucial input on the following aspects of the BPS school account. The central thesis of gamification is that we take things which are mostly painful, awkward, boring, banal, uh, quotidian, and we make them fun. We make them engaging. We bring a little bit of surprise and delight, and we tie it to a longer term arc of behavior, a longer system of what we call progression and mastery, which is the core of gamified design. All right, so here we go. What's the what can the challenge be? How do you think we can get kids to stop making excuses? What's the number one excuse you hear every day? What's the excuse you hate? What's the excuse you make every day? There's another mechanism in Community Planet, which is called challenges. And really what challenges are just are just user-generated questions or prompts for, for other people. And Already, you know, we've seen some really interesting use uh, from the kids in these challenges. I got, oh, I got something for you, a challenge. Why don't you go 24 hours, no excuses, no ands, if, buts, no nothing. And please come below, video response, everything. Thank you very much. I will tell you that from an engagement standpoint, if it's real and it's meaningful and the kids understand it, and they understand what putting their effort into something is going to deliver, they will go hard and do their best. They'll learn it, deeply learn something. If they know that the work is going to affect some, some change. We spent a lot of time spreading the word, like play this game, community planet, it's new, you can communicate with people, get involved in the community. Oh, this is like the big town hall meeting thing. If you go I think English actually won the competition for like most accounts on community planet. Like we actually, we really got the word spread around the whole school. Yes. 
Awesome. Right. Good job. Good job. Bye. <laughs> so now suddenly you have kids that are just producing games or just producing videos or just producing a blog. But it's about producing a blog, a game, a video that does action in the world. So the model of pedagogy behind it is really radical. It's to say that teaching would look a lot more like community organizing, where the first question is, what do you as a community want to accomplish? And then your job is to figure out, how do I marshal resources to help you accomplish that? And along the way, to uh, tool you up with practices, knowledge, dispositions that you keep for a lifetime. Over the 35 days that this game was played in the Boston Public Schools, there was an incremental change in culture from within, where people in the central office of, of the Boston Public Schools started saying, you know what, this is pretty cool. People are engaging, and look, there's youth on here, there's adults on here, and people are saying smart things. We're going to get started. Thank, thanks, everybody, for, uh, for showing up on, uh, on this Thursday night to come and talk about um, what's happening in the district and help the district figure out the school performance index. And this is what some of us in this room have been doing for the last 35 days. Uh, in playing Community Planet. And then they have this town hall meeting, and the kids had to assume sort of uh, leadership roles. You guys pretty much know like what's going on, right? Yeah. All right, cool. So we have kids graduating now who cannot read the Boston Globe. Sitting in a seat for two extra years when they should have graduated two years ago. She can't concentrate on her work, maybe, because she knows that she has what she has to go home to. They're engaged. Maybe she finds a way to adapt what she's teaching. Sophia. Since Community Planet, I've learned to be more of a leader. We hosted a, a town hall meeting here. We helped facilitate others. We were leading people, and it was just amazing. Yeah, so this is really cool. You guys feel good? Yeah. Excited? You ready? Okay, don't be nervous. It's a friendly crowd. Next thing you know, we're being asked to speak to the superintendent, and I would have initially thought that they would be reluctant or scared, but they really got jazzed about the idea of, of engaging with the top leadership. Um, one of the things that I learned is that people actually do want to be heard. I'm a student in high school and the rules get made, they get enforced on me, I just do them. And I never really thought too much about like where they come from, why they're enforced. And so to see these people come out and actually want to get together, they want to be a part of the rules being made, it really made a difference to me. I actually like paid attention to it and noticed it. We were chose to pilot this game. We learned how to play it. We watched how it worked. And then we dominated it. <laughs> in America, in the public schools, and particularly in urban schools, our kids are being asked to learn things in a bubble. And the things that they're learning have nothing to do with the lives that they lead at present or the lives that they probably see themselves leading down the road. We're asking them to learn things. We're not telling them why this is important. Wow, achievement gaps. They're like In this class, I'm able to leverage the digital media and social networks and things like Community Planet because there's an audience, a ready-made audience. They can address the world. I know that kids are incredibly creative in the way that they're learning and the way that they're communicating with each other and, and participating in the culture. But there does have to be that time when, when the adult world says, you know what, that's, that's legitimate and that's really meaningful. And I feel like what we've done here and, and the kind of goal of this is to sort of get at that, that meaningful acknowledgement from the, the uh, formal system of education to informal modes of learning. It is going to take a shift in culture, and I think we have to be realistic. That shift is not easy. We're going to have to recognize the degree to which young people can learn from one another, the degree to which there isn't always going to be one right answer, that what we really want to foster is participation and discussion. If we show them the ways in which the things they're learning in school can help them engage with the things they care about in their broader life, we're going to find higher levels of engagement and deeper learning.
First, we know that in the field of psychology, that the thing that's studied the most is interest and motivation of each and every person. Do we pay attention to that in schools? No, not the way we should. Are you getting real choices in your school about what you want to learn? Are you getting time to practice what you want to get better at? And if the pull of those essentials outside a school becomes too great, it creates inauthenticity in a school environment and also pushes you to leave. I've always had this thing with India. I mean, I don't know why I've always wanted to go to India because of yoga and because of the Buddha. So I thought, what if I wrote a book on you know, how they use their healing, what their culture is like in the spirituality there, number one, so that I can learn and so that people can learn and sort of be inspired by, you know, this girl followed her dreams, look what she's done. I was a good student, I always got straight A's, but it wasn't hard. All you really have to do is memorize a couple things in the textbook, and then you pass the test, and then you never have to remember it again. And there wasn't a lot of freedom, except for your electives, so you really didn't get power in what direction that you wanted to go. And I don't think that that's very empowering, because it made me feel like I had no control over my future. High school made me snap awake and realize that this isn't what I wanted to do. I was born here in Oakland. I've been living here all my life. I feel differently when I do work for school because uh, I don't really learn a lot of things about the real world. I just learn, you know, behind the book. I learn what to do because of the standards that, I need to re that are required for me to meet. And uh, it really kills my motivation in a way because it doesn't really give me the creativity I need or for me to use my creativity to do something else. And I find it better to just work by myself and just learn what I need to learn. I'll probably just use this for the back of the green screen so like, the shadows will be off. But like that angle? That's good. Well, the Gates Foundation tells us that more kids today are dropping out of school because they're bored than because they're unable to deal with the current educational standards. We've lowered the standards so far that we've, we, their eyes glaze over when they're listening in the classroom. So the first step is to find the thing the kid cares about. They've got to find their happy place. They've got to find their passion and pursue it. And as they do it then, I think they do become better students. They do open up to learning. And that's part of what has to take place. Exhale, hands to the heart. So we can stay here. Get taller by pressing down. And first do your twist. I've always known that I wanted a career or a future in preventative natural medicine. And so I just came home and I said, you know, Mom, can I do online school so I have more time to do what I want to do? And we started looking into that, and it actually it was more time than regular school. So I was getting sort of bummed and then we found the innovation lab and you get to do what you want all day. I still got to be focused, but focus on what I wanted to do all day. And that seemed like a much better fit for me. That's what the innovation lab is at the core about. It's really about here's a child who has a dream or an idea or something they're passionate about and we're providing a space for them to figure that out. Then we put it in an ice water bath and we mix it with the electric mixer. What we found was an unmet need that people were stressed and people weren't themselves and the way to facilitate that is to create spaces of permission. So Sierra is a perfect example of what happens when you set an individual free, when you let a kid pick their mentors, pick their topics. Brought you some books. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yeah, that one's kind of fun. Um, different ways to put food up. I know you're really into gardening. Yeah. That's been a book that I've been wanting to check out for a while, and I thought you might. I like took it. a tour of the house, and Monica sort of explained to me that you find mentors that do what you want to do already, and that are willing to help you. 
not necessarily teach you, but they can give you tools. And so I found my first two mentors the first day I got there. I'm sort of thinking or looking what other degrees there are besides just the naturopathic doctor, mm -hmm. just because I sort of want to start focusing in my interest on what I like most. If you know of any other things that you may think I would find interesting or... Well, I can tell you kind of what I did. Okay. Um, I actually started out in biomedical engineering. And so when people intend to learn something, they're finding this material, and there's no better time to learn something than when you intend to learn it. Whereas in school, it's totally backwards, right? You're sort of forced to learn something and sort of shuts you down to the learning. You can find you know, anything, photography, painting, art, athletics. I mean, the, the amount of information that's available and the kinds of communities and resources that are available, if you want to dig in, are, are truly astounding. The acromial clavicular, meaning it attaches from the acromion process in the clavicle to the actual clavicle. This clavicle right here, there's a little ligament that kind of keeps this continuity here. So you got that little kind of bone, the acromion in your scapula. And I think something that we have to think about is, are we preparing kids so that they can develop a passion, have an interest, identify a community, and if one doesn't exist, even start one of their own and say, hey, I want to learn to do whatever their hobby is or interest is, and, and can they leverage a community or even start their own and organize that community to get where they want to go? Those people who can do that are going to have an enormous leg up, certainly in this kind of an economy where we value entrepreneurship and we say, you know, the jobs of yesterday aren't going to be there tomorrow. So this is what we need. This, these are the, the critical skills, and we think it shouldn't be you know, the oddity that happens outside of school, but that should be the fundamental purpose of education. I get out of breath right there. Just, uh, never mind. We already got the first verse. Just do the second verse. United Roots was born out of work that I had been doing in Oakland for over 10 years. There was a need in the community to have a community center that could serve uh, teenagers to build friendship, be connected to mentors, and to use media as a way to communicate and create a dialogue. Art as a way to energize the community to express what was happening. <laughs> Not bad. Um, can we do something where you can do stuff with words, stuff that she says coming in there? We could. Like flying in, <clears throat> flying out. But that take like a week or two. It's kind of. Um, it's, it's, it's cool, but it's kind of dry, bro. So we're gonna put another week into it to get it right. <laughs> if you want, I can. Take I mean, I'm gonna keep it solid. I'm gonna keep it solid. It's okay. We also really wanted to make sure that we had a strong educational model, so these young people um, cannot not just be building community and telling their story, but actually learning professional skills in video production, graphic design, music production, and really setting up apprenticeship style learning environment where youth learn skills through an experiential process connected with mentors in the industry. I learned about film on my own. I just took up the, the knowledge of the internet YouTube, Vimeo, a lot of behind the scenes and directors that I like. And I see how, the, how they work and I try to imitate that in my own workflow. And uh, United Roots gave me the camera and I just learned on my own. Phenomenal job, man. That's just like Phenomenal. Be a first green screen video. That's just like rough. Dang, that's super dope. Like, I ain't never seen nothing like it. <laughs> <laughs> I think formal learning institutions like schools, if historically we've, we've hired people to stand up and tell you this reified information, which you can get free online, it's anywhere. Um, what is our role going to be? And we think what that role is going to be is, is really connecting learners to one another, connecting them to social networks where they get access to more information, and then putting them in situations where they get to communicate and they are a part of a culture. Being active and moving around to different places is a big part of what I do because I see it as just a big network. All the knowledge isn't gonna be found in one place. You know? So I try to get out and go to different places around the community and 
meet new people that you know might be interested in what I'm doing and it also helps me stay sane because I can't sit in the room for a long time. When I go to school, I wake up kind of tense because I don't want to go to school. I don't have that motivation to go to school. It's really boring. And then when I come here, it's more fun than just sitting in class because, you know, I have film and music at my hands, you know. What can be better than that? You know, whereas I'm at, I'm at school and, you know, I just have to sit quietly and pay attention. Exhale, swan dive forward. Inhale your right leg up. Exhale, slowly lunge it through your hands. Slow, 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 really feeling that core. I'm the youngest yoga instructor in the United States. It was a great learning experience for me, and it also helped me mature, knowing that I made it through that 200-hour training, and I graduated, and now I can go out there and teach. And my only concern with the whole thing at the very beginning was the long-term go to college. Sometimes it's a little nerve-wracking because we don't know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there's a lot of trust, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the challenges is also the self-direction, the ability to really Woody. determine what you want to do with your life and to, to let that set sail and grow. It's so deeply cynical to ask the question, how is it that what kids are doing in their real world lives pays off in classrooms? Because classrooms were intended originally to pay off in the real world. The world is changing in a way so fast with the technology and the kinds of skills that kids need to get jobs are not the skills that you needed 15 years ago. You gotta be more entrepreneurial, you gotta be more collaborative, you gotta be more creative. The first blog that I made was my reschool blog. My second blog is called Into Out Beauty. And then my third blog is called A Healthy Teen's Tips. I blog because it's evidence of what I've been doing. And it's also a way for me to get out in the world and prove that it doesn't matter what age you are, you can be whatever you want to be. And to find like-minded people who can offer any knowledge or you know send me to another person who they think could offer me something um so what we're gonna do is we're gonna set up right in front and i think we're gonna do like three interviews cool. um, so i'll shoot uh tiana and um i want you to get the side profile okay you know be roll with that but, um, i think with luis we recognized he was very strong in making music videos but he had an interest to get into filmmaking so we had to start identifying other mentors and people in the community that he could work with. I'm Tiana McQuise bringing you another episode of Good News in Oakland. You guys know what we're Good News in Oakland is what we call psychological renewable energy. It's a uh, socially responsible media that focuses on all the good things that are happening in the city of Oakland. So, with this clip right here, we got a front view of her and then we got a side view of her. So actually while she's talking, we can go back and forth. Maybe once you switch to the guy, he says something, you catch a reaction of it. Right. We decided to partner with them and create a Good News in Oakland youth video crew. Have Luis um, work with this video journalism company to, to shadow them and see how they do video journalism and reporting and just learn the ins and outs of filming and mic placement and editing, but then eventually to, to launch a program where other young people at United Roots would start to, to learn these skills and actually build a team. My future plans for what I'm doing now, it's, um, you know, just create as many videos as possible, submit them to film festivals, try to create a client base, you know, and, uh, you know, that could be a possible way to live. I don't know what, what's the worst that could happen if I gave it 100%. Good, how are you? Good. How have you been? Thank you for all your emails. You're welcome. I've been good. Busy. <laughs> Probably the biggest thing I'm doing right now is this India trip yeah. because um, so the trip I consists of, you know, the spiritual, the nutrition, 
and the cultural perspective, and that's huge in natural medicine. Okay, so, you know, May, depending where you're going, is the hottest time because you're talking about 130 degrees um, in Delhi and um, high humidity and then the rains start. You know, you need to be really careful traveling to third world countries because, again, the the kind of tendency to get sick and eat from the food also is more at that time. So that's probably the biggest thing I'm doing right now is trying to get down there to write a book about it so that I can learn and so that I can teach other people to learn. This isn't just a trip. What you're starting here is a business. And we'll look at each step of the business. And the first step was making sure that Sierra understood the business. We're confident in our process of building this business. We've looked at almost every aspect, and I don't see any reason that there should be anything that we can't get past. So I told my parents about it, and my dad said, you know, you need to talk to Barry Maddies. He's a business guy, and his dream is to help kids start businesses. He's coached me through making a business plan, which includes a proposal, you know, a cash flow sheet, and also, you know, mentoring me on staying positive. I think you're ready to go sell this thing, and I think people are going to support you in a big way beyond belief. Thank you. The example of uh, online mentoring is incredible. Mentoring is a very old practice, and uh, we know it to be a very effective practice. So when we have so much access to the internet and have people being able to readily and quickly exchange ideas and information, these are powerful mentoring and protege relationships that are happening. The number one biggest problem with school is that they're not facing up to the problem of relevance. How to find a real and relevant problem that students can get engaged in, and then in a way, once you do that, you can sort of just take the shackles off and let them run because they're going to do all kinds of amazing things and they're going to start feeling their way through this, this knowledge machine that's all around them. This is the essay I wrote for my college application. I am involved in social activism because I fell in love with a book. When I received Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone for my sixth birthday, no one could have predicted the immense impact that book and its sequels would have on my life. By early adolescence, I had reread Harry's tale so many times that I could recite portions by heart, but it was not until I discovered the Harry Potter Alliance that my passion grew into something greater. I am proud to present the CEO I just want to say that I've been part of this fandom for a really long time. This is one of the most amazing things I've ever seen. Give yourselves a huge round of applause. In 2005, I started the Harry Potter Alliance. The Harry Potter Alliance essentially is an organization that uses parallels from Harry Potter to inspire hundreds of thousands of Harry Potter fans across the world to act as heroes in our world. Jojo! So I wrote this action alert. I posted it on the Harry Potter Alliance MySpace. We had a couple hundred uh, friends. I checked to see how many friend requests the Harry Potter Alliance had. We were having hundreds. I kept hitting refresh, and hundreds more kept coming. I was like, what is going on? Uh, we were getting comments from all over the world, regards from France, uh, people in Latin America saying, I've always wanted this. I've always wanted to be a hero like the characters in these books. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I, I didn't know it was happening. It became an international organization within an hour. Have you heard of the Harry Potter Alliance? We have over a hundred chapters. They work kind of like club, Harry Potter Alliance clubs in their communities. So they collect books, they collect signatures, they go out into their communities. This is one of our chapter organizers. Her name is Anna. She's also a prefect. I think that because I found the Harry Potter Alliance at a time where I was so in love with the books and everything that they were saying, it helped me make the connection. And the HPA gave me the leap from the morals of the stories to how you can apply those to our world. This is an extraordinary migration of fans into citizens. 
We know from the research that it's really hard to move young people past a certain age into political participation. This is determined by their parents' political affiliation, their civic teachers, their involvement in extracurricular activities. But what we're finding is the Harry Potter Alliance takes kids who are culturally active and helps them to find ways to become politically active. Okay, so I work for the Harry Potter Alliance, which is a nonprofit. We're working with Warner Brothers right now, asking them to make all of their Harry Potter products fair trade, specifically their chocolate products. So we are having people film video howlers to Warner Brothers, asking them to switch to fair trade stuff. The current campaign that the Harry Potter Alliance is doing is not in Harry's name, and the focus of that is to get Warner Brothers to start creating chocolate products through fair trade means. Uh, just. I think we're going to have an intro animation, Okay. so you can, like, intro animation plays Muggle Howlers and then just start talking about the campaign. Okay. I'm going to, like, lose my words, Yeah. I'm so we'll probably have to be a take mess. this a couple of times. Yeah. The problem we have with the chocolate is we have no way of knowing if that chocolate came from child slaves. We have no way of knowing what the conditions of those farmers were when the chocolate was originally cocoa. The best way that we know is the fair trade label to ensure no child slaves were involved, no exploitation was involved. It was a straight up, good, clean operation. We haven't wanted to burn our connections with Warner Brothers, so we've been being nice in our communications. And we think um, that in some of our niceness, they've kind of written us off. So now we are going to have to amp this up. We're not interested in being nice for the sake of being nice. Dumbledore reminded us we must do what is right over what is easy, and that's what we're going to do in this case, even if it means them not liking us. Hey guys, I'm Lauren, and this is Abby from the Harry Potter Alliance, and we're here at the Quidditch World Cup talking to people about fair trade chocolate. We want to make sure that they're not making their chocolate by child slaves, because that's not in the spirit of Harry Potter. So here's how you guys can help. We've started this brand new channel, Muggle Howlers, and we want you guys to submit your own video versions of Howlers to tell Warner Brothers why fair trade chocolate is important. So be creative, keep it under one minute, and upload it as a response to this video, or tag it with Muggle Howlers, and we'll add it to a playlist on this channel so Warner Brothers can hear your voice. Some of the themes in the books are subtler than others, like Hermione starts an organization called Society for the Protection of Elfish Welfare, and that is an organization that protects the rights of the workers, and that's sort of where we drew a lot of our basis for Not in Harry's Name, because like Hermione wanted to protect the um, house elves, we want to help protect the people who are making chocolate. And how is that equality? How is that any different than what Voldemort was trying to do to the muggles? Because he thought he was better than them. It starts with love, and it starts with caring, it starts with giving back. You got this chocolate fair trade. Fair trade. Warner Brothers, how dare you? This fandom was so disappointed when we found out the magic of these books might be copyrighted to you, but it belongs to us. With regards, Vanessa. It is going to be up to our teenage members, our college students, who lead this organization to make this happen. That means getting out messages on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, coordinating with other fan communities, and coordinating with every facet of the Harry Potter fan community. Is there a project that I can help with while before this meeting? You're meeting with Jennifer and Lauren today about video stuff. The Muggle Howlers page, like the YouTube page? Yeah. Um, when are we in that? Like, when are we sort of making what we're doing public? Well, I would say what's radically new about the Harry Potter Alliance is that it's so dispersed. It's dispersed geographically. It's not defined entirely by where people live, but what their, what their sense of their identity is. It's dispersed and ideologically, right? It's not a single issue activist group. It's a group whose mission continues to evolve over time that's tackled many social problems. And I think that's part of what's really fascinating about this kind of new style of participatory politics. Oh, it's going to be a busy week. I can feel it. I, well, yeah, and also we definitely need to be prepared. I don't think that you could do any of this without the technology that exists today. The HPA is entirely online. Our community is spread out all over the United States, and we even have staffers from Ireland and places like that. We have a Facebook for the Harry Potter Alliance, a Twitter, a YouTube, a Tumblr blog, and all of these are connected, and a 140-character tweet is not going to be the same as a two-minute video we'll upload to YouTube, but they're all pushing the same message. Ah, there we go. Hi. Okay, so let me take a look at what you've done. A great deal, deal of our chocolate comes from farmers who continue to be exploited and pushed into situations that perpetuate poverty. 
and in many cases children who are enslaved on cocoa plantations. I don't know if we want something a little more emotional than that for the closing, but it, I think it just really clearly explains the issue. We could totally put that in there like that. What paragraph is it in? When somebody like Abby is using social media to communicate mm -hmm. and to organize and to actually do problem solving, it's interesting because you're not talking about problem solving anymore. You're talking about problem multiplication and problem sequentially is being solved. Because if you're blasting out something to three or four hundred or three or four thousand followers, what you immediately get back is some kind of adaptation. So instead of the problem being a thing, the problem becomes a process. It's pretty amazing because that's, that's what the work world is like. Yeah. Is that good? Yeah. I like it. Okay. That's a good introduction. No one can solve all the problems of the world, but once you're connected to the world, you're connected to all the world's problems and to all the world's solutions. Yeah. That's breathtaking, especially for kids who spend uh, most of their yeah, days in school learning that at the end of the year, they're gonna have a test that has an A, B, C, D answer. Learning through social networking doesn't have A, B, C, D answers. It has all of the above, none of the above, and constantly changing answers. Are you ready to help? All right. Are you ready to be a Dumbledore's army for our world? Awesome. I don't think that there's anything I've done necessarily in my school that is comparable to what I'm doing. It's very much a hands-on experience and it feels like we are making a difference and we are doing something that is helping people. Did you ever think that it wasn't a good use of my time, that it wasn't something that I should be focusing on? We had conversations about that, mm -hmm. about how much work you had at school and all the other things you were doing and whether the amount of time you were spending on the internet was productive time or was it just you more or less wasting time and not doing the things you needed to do. Whether it you was safe <laughs> when you were younger. That yeah. There was a lot of concern about who you were meeting and you would want to go off to these places and meet up with all these people that we didn't know and that was... That was very odd, you know, at, at 13 when you first started. And then, then we started to get, you, you made us meet the people. I tried to make it seem safe and normal to you guys. As chapter organizer, I adapted projects from the national organization to make them accessible to our local membership. I called residents in states facing marriage equality referendums and asked them to vote for equal rights because I learned from a werewolf in the Potter books how unfair it is to be treated differently for your identity. I ran annual book drives for disadvantaged children because I want others to find themselves in a story, as I did with Harry Potter. Well, I'm very interested in this concept of connected learning, and connected learning suggests that there should be a learning ecology, that what we do outside of school should be connected in very strong ways to what we do inside of school. That doesn't mean more homework. What it means is quite the opposite, is the school has to respond to the informal learning that's taking place at home and in the community. That means teachers recognizing a gifted kid like Abby who's driven by clear passions and goals and find ways to integrate that into the classroom. It's not clear yet exactly what that looks like. We've got a standards-driven educational system that sort of treats every kid exactly the same. At a time, in fact, where we should be encouraging kids to develop individual expertise, we instead want to hold everyone accountable knowing exactly the same things and nothing more and nothing less. We've sort of locked down school content and cut it off from the rest of their learning. And I think school suffers from that as much as the outside world suffers from disrupting the kind of connection that the learning ecology should represent. It's critical that we tell resourceful young people like Luis, Sierra, and Abby that what they care about is just as important as what we want them to care about. And that we let Xavier and Monica know that they were leaders, not because we let them lead, but because they were eager to rise to the challenge. And we tell the kids from Rivers Alternative that because of them, there's an elephant in Hope, Maine. Preparing our young people to live and work in this century will require taking advantage of all of the tools and resources that are available to them, both inside and out of school. And it will mean embracing and including a wider range of opportunities for learning and participating as part of a 21st century education. As the education reformer John Dewey famously put it, education is not preparation for life, education is life itself.
For educational resources and more stories of how young people are engaging in their communities, following passions, and connecting school to the world outside, go to pbs.org, where you can also view the program online. Is School Enough is available on DVD. To order, please visit shoppbs.org or call us at 1-800-PLAY-PBS.